So our last problem that we want to look at <coughs> is then what's known as the soap bubble problem. So here we have the, the line, the curve that we're parameterizing. Uh, so again, y here, which depends on x, uh, which we're then going to rotate about a particular axis, which is coplanar to these points. So meaning I could rotate it this way, or I could rotate it this way, or any way that I basically wanted to, as long as that axis is coplanar. Uh, and then we wanted to minimize the amount of area which is generated by this rotation. So basically the area or the surface area which is actually generated, in this case then we want to minimize it and see what this actually happens to be. So <clears throat> having said that, so again what we want to do is basically take the same path on this side. This is doing something like this. So we're rotating this thing then about this say this axis. And then we want to go ahead and <clears throat> minimize this particular area. <clears throat> so all this means then is that our j in this case is going to be equal to the area, which is then going to be the integral over the differential area. So let's put this in a little bit of context. Uh, so basically let's I put in some sort of coordinate system. Uh, so for now, let's say we're going to rotate about this the x-axis, call this the y-axis, so that this is the z-axis, so that this has point x1, y1, and then point x2, y2. So again, our endpoints are fixed, so we're going to move this from point x1, y1 to some point x2, y2, and then simply again rotate this around the x-axis to then generate this area. So <clears throat> let's say we're looking at this point here. So let me cut out this section here, All right. so that this thing has a height then y, and then across here, since this is not quite a straight line, this is going to go from here to here. So here I'm going to integrate from x to x plus dx along this particular curve. So basically my area then, at least my differential area, is going to be equal to, so here again I'm wrapping this guy around, so this is actually creating a disk, i.e. a circle whose circumference then, since I'm only looking at the surface area, is going to be 2 pi times the radius here, which is simply y. So it's going to be 2 pi y times then the thickness of this. But again, I'm integrating along some particular path. So this is then just going to be simply ds. Okay. Now, as we know before, ds is the same thing as before. So it's going to be 2 pi y uh, times the square root of 1 plus y prime squared dx. Something stuck to my foot. There you go. <laughs> so, anyways, so basically what I can do is I can factor out the 2 pi because I don't really care as much about that. So, this is going to be 2 pi integral over dx. So, it's going to be from x1 to x2 of then y squared root of y plus y prime squared dx. Right? So, basically, from here, we can then see that's what f at least in this scenario, then it's going to be equal to y times the square root of 1 plus y prime squared. Is that a little bit bigger? There we go. So here, now this thing actually does depend on x, or sorry, does depend on y and does depend on y prime. So here, the partial of f with respect to y is then just going to be this term. It's going to be the square root of 1 plus y prime squared. And then when I take the partial, with respect to y prime, then that's going to be equal to what? So I'm going to have y times a y prime divided by the square root of 1 plus y prime squared. Right. The reason for that is here when I take the derivative, I get a 1 half, and then this term moves to the bottom, and then I get a 2 times y prime, so the 1 half is basically going to cancel. Now if I plug this into Euler's equation, Euler's equation then says that what? The derivative of this with respect to x must be equal to this because remember we have the partial with respect of f with respect to y minus the derivative uh, with respect to x of then the partial with respect to y prime or that's the same thing as saying this has to be equal to this with that derivative. So ultimately this is going to be then equal to d dx of y times y prime square root of 1 plus y prime squared must then be equal to uh, simply the square root of 1 plus y prime squared. So basically, to solve this, we would then have to solve this differential equation, and 
then go ahead and solve this now for <clears throat> y, right? Because what we want to know then is what the path that this thing has to follow to minimize this particular surface area. Now, this can be pretty complicated. We're not going to do that. What we're going to do instead is simply take a step back and see, well, was there another way that we could have done this problem to actually make this a little bit easier? Okay. So let's go back to what we did here. So what we did is we chose that here we're going to rotate it about the x-axis, which basically means that we're now choosing a particular independent uh, variable. And then from that independent variable, we're then doing this particular integral. But this wasn't the only choice, because again, we could have rotated this thing about pretty much any axis that we chose, as long as that point was actually coplanar. Which means that we could have simply moved around our coordinate axes. As I said, another way to think about it is instead of rotating it this way, we could have rotated it that way. Or I could simply just relabel these in a different fashion. So for example, I could have called this the y-axis, could have called this the x-axis, which means that this would have been the minus z-axis. So in that case, what would have been different then, of course, is now this would have been x, and then this would have been y1, x1, and this would have been y2, x2, and then here we would have been integrating from what? y to y plus dy. Now if I do that, basically meaning I'm choosing a different independent variable, which in this question my independent variable then is going to be x before my independent variable was y, which means then that this is now going to be equal to basically the same thing as before, so 2 pi times the radius, but my radius now is x instead of uh, y times again ds, that portion doesn't change, so this is going to be essentially equal to 2 pi integral of then x times the square root of 1 plus y prime squared dx. Now what happens in this case then is that f is different. So f now is going to be equal to x square root of 1 plus y prime squared, which means that f now has no dependence on y. It only has dependence on y prime which means that the partial derivative of f with respect to y is now simply equal to zero, which means that our uh, Lagrangian, or our, sorry, our Euler equation now becomes what? The partial derivative of this with respect to y prime, which is simply going to be then x times y prime divided by the square root of one plus y prime squared. And that has now be equal to zero because this term is actually equal to zero. So by doing this, or basically by simply choosing a different independent axis, or at least a different independent coordinate, in this case we actually are going to get something much simpler <clears throat> to solve. So if we actually solve this guy, which is actually much easier to solve, since this thing is simply equal to a constant, or at least equal to zero, integrating this means that the part on the inside here must simply be equal to a constant. So we're going to get x times y prime divided by the square root of 1 plus y prime squared. That actually looks like a x instead of lambda. Must be equal to some constant. Let's call that constant simply a. Now here, we can solve this easily now for y prime. Right? So again, we would square both sides, multiply through, find y prime. So here we would get y prime then is equal to a divided by the square root of x squared minus a. Sorry, I took a square root, that should be an a squared. Sorry about that. There we go. I'm wondering it didn't look right. Uh, and now I can use separation variables and simply integrate this guy because this is now dy dx. So in this case, I would simply integrate. This side would become y. This side I would integrate with respect to x, which is simply a hyperbolic cosine. <laughs> so in this case, so that, what we find in this case then is that what y then would be equal to the integral of a dx divided by the square root of x squared minus a squared, which again is simply a hyperbolic cosine, or inverse hyperbolic cosine, of then uh, x divided by a 
plus some other constant. Let's just simply call that guy B. <clears throat> so good. So now if I solve this guy for x, we would then do what? Subtract B over here, divide by A, and then take a arc or cosine of both sides, or hyperbolic cosine of both sides. So finally what we get then is that x sine is equal to A times the hyperbolic cosine then of Y minus B divided by A. <clears throat> so the solution of this is actually what's called a catenary. So this is the solution of a flexible cord which is allowed to basically hang between two points. So this is point and this is one point. Then it would basically just do something like this. So this is what's called a catenary. So here, so the point of doing all this, and what I really wanted to point out in this problem, is that what? Sometimes by choosing particular axes that we want to do things about, or basically, again, choosing particular independent variables, will sometimes make our lives very difficult, and sometimes will make our lives a lot easier. The choice of which way that we want to do it will then basically determine the easiness or the hardness of this particular problem. So, <clears throat> now, is there a way to actually choose and figure out which one is going to give us something easy and which one's going to give us something hard? Uh, well, sometimes the answer to that is no. <laughs> uh, sometimes, uh, or at least in general, the answer is no. Uh, pretty much it just kind of comes from experience and kind of comes from doing these problems a lot where you can kind of see, okay, so if I do it this way, you know, I'm going to get something where that derivative is not going to give me zero. What if I do it this way? That derivative will be equal to zero, which is going to lead me to something much simpler to solve. Now, again, at the end of the day, it shouldn't matter which one that I actually rotate this about. Because what? If I simply rotate this way or if I rotate this way, you know, symmetry-wise, there's nothing here that is keeping me from doing that. Right? There's no forces or anything that's dictating that I have to do it in one particular direction as opposed to another direction. I have no constraints in this case. So based off of symmetry, I should be able to have exactly the same answer doing it either way. <clears throat> but again, depending on which one I choose as the uh, independent, which one I choose as the dependent will sometimes then give me things that I can't actually solve right away, as opposed to, again, simply relabeling things or at least rotating about a different axis. Uh, that will then give me something that's a lot easier to be able to solve. So this is just what I wanted to point out in this problem. That again, our choices will sometimes be make our problems easier or sometimes make our problems harder. <clears throat>